This video is brought to you by Surfshark VPN. What's up guys, Helen here. You don't have to be choking down an Herbalife protein shake while wearing a buttery soft pair of LuLaRoe leggings to know that multi-level marketing is everywhere. You may associate MLMs with your Facebook friend Ash Linden, the homecoming queen who got married young and now slides into your DMs with business opportunities. But globally, 100 million households buy into an MLM every year. And at any given moment, one in six American households are under contract with one of these companies. And trust us, they would love to make you their next recruit. And yes, dunking on MLMs has become something of a pastime. You've seen John Oliver's eviscerating expose on Last Week Tonight, or perhaps listened to the podcast The Dream. But just in case you're still debating whether or not to take a second mortgage out on your home in order to buy a wholesale supply of protein bars, let us be crystal clear. MLMs are categorically a scam. Statistically, you're more likely to profit from gambling in a casino than from joining an MLM. That said, today we're not going to regurgitate every point about this icky industry, no matter how alarming and valid those points may be. Instead, we're going to ask, why have MLMs become such a mainstay of the global economy? And what does it say about us, both as people and as society? I'm scared to learn the answer, but sure, let's explore in this Wisecrack edition how MLMs took over the world. But before we dive in, I want to talk about this week's sponsor, Surfshark VPN. Surfshark VPN's uncrackable encryption and secure protocols help keep your data secure as you click around the internet. There are so many upsides to using a secure VPN like Surfshark, but one perk of using it is that the internet can't determine where in the world I am, and that opens up a world of possibility. I can stream movies and TV from other countries, and whenever I'm in the mood to even visit another country, I can make sure I get the best price on my plane tickets. How? Because I can avoid location-based price discrimination by connecting my secure Surfshark VPN to other VPNs in different countries until I discover the best deal. With just one subscription, all of your favorite devices are covered. We're talking about your laptop, Android, PlayStation, and Xbox, Amazon Fire Stick, and beyond. And you'll find options for your favorite apps too, like Firefox and Chrome. So get started today by clicking the link in the description and using the promo code WISECRACK. And starting on November 1st, you can get Surfshark VPN for 83% off plus four extra months for free. This deal goes until December 31st, so be sure to check it out. Go to surfshark.deals slash wisecrack or hit the link in the description. Protect yourself online and download Surfshark VPN today. And now, back to the show. Now, to understand the power of MLMs, it helps to know where they came from. The basic MLM model was first invented and implemented by an unlikely trio of men in the early 1940s a failed entrepreneur, a radio show psychologist, and a salesman turned sales manager for the world's fanciest cemetery. A real holy trinity of dudes you wouldn't want to sit next to on a cross-country flight. Each of these men is, um, uh, unique. First, we've got failed entrepreneur Carl Renberg, who banked his fortunes on selling evaporated milk to the burgeoning 1920s Chinese market, despite the fact that the culture's cuisine used almost no dairy. After a couple more failed businesses, he put processed alfalfa sprouts into a capsule, called it a vitamin, and then desperately tried and failed to sell it via his company, Neutralite. Also in this bro squad, we have radio show psychologist William S. Castleberry, who wrote books with dubious titles like How to Work Miracles in Your Life, The Golden Secret of Successful Living. Hurting for money, Castleberry signed on to become a salesman for Renborg's Neutralite. But the most interesting player has got to be Lee Meitinger, door-to-door -door salesman turned sales manager for Los Angeles Forest Lawn Cemetery, which is only a few miles from Wisecrack's world headquarters. Today, your decaying body can still find rest in this fancy-ass burial ground, and we hope you love it there. But heads up that you will be surrounded by an art museum, gift shop, and reproductions of classic Italian statues that have a penchant for randomly toppling to the ground. Meitinger's job might seem innocuous in a modern day context. After all, the funeral process is really fucking expensive, no matter where you live. But prior to 1920, most people used to get their burial plots at a low cost or via donation from churches or other nonprofits. That is, until entrepreneurs sent hordes of direct door-to-door -door salesmen to peddle yoga mat-sized chunks of land to people who were, well, not dead yet. And when someone had actually died, these salesmen would often exploit the grief of family members. They'd do things like pressuring them to do right by their dead relatives by investing in expensive funeral costs. Now, it's not like people woke up one day wanting to spend thousands of dollars on their final resting place. So the more than 100 cemetery salesmen that Meitinger managed had a very specific and very ambitious job. They had to create a widespread want and need for a product that nobody had asked for. They weren't responding to natural consumer demand, they were providing a supply of something people were used to getting for cheap and or free. But Meitinger was annoyed by one aspect of his job description 
training salesmen who would eventually get promoted to manager. Once promoted, he stopped earning commission off of their sales, let alone anybody they managed. Meitinger dreamed of creating a business model that would allow him to continue to profit off of his underling's success. He envisioned a world where I keep the income from the people I develop. So Cemetery Guy and the radio psychologist met in a self-improvement course and became best buds. In 1943, they developed The Plan, which they brought to their vitamin buddy, Renborg. The Plan was a new way for him to market and sell his alfalfa capsules. This plan detailed the nuts and bolts of multi-level marketing, aka a recruitment-based direct sales force. And this alfalfa sprout has sprouted MLMs as we know them today. Faced with an unremarkable item that nobody wanted to buy, our trio did something savvy. They created a fake demand by recruiting a growing army of salespeople who had to buy a stockpile of vitamins they would then try and fail to sell. And those 1940 salespeople were spurred on by all the same promises you hear today endless revenue possibilities, becoming a small business owner, working flexible hours, and so on. And if they recruited some unsuspecting friends, they'd be paid a pretty penny for their trouble. The company had a standard five get five plan, in which each member, starting with the founders, was tasked with recruiting five new salespeople. So you get commission for everyone you recruit, and everyone your recruits recruit, and so on. This might seem innocuous at its face, but pull out a calculator and you'll quickly see that this process can only last for approximately 13 rounds before you need to recruit more than the entire population of the planet, according to multi-level marketing critic Robert Fitzpatrick. And there's every reason to believe the founders of the first MLM knew that the exponential growth plan was entirely unsustainable. In fact, one of these clowns even joked that everyone on Earth would eventually be selling the product. And in a way, it worked. Neutralite's revenue grew by an astounding 50,000% in just nine years. Of course, that revenue, under the plan, mostly flew to the top 4% of the food chain, those who had recruited early on and now had thousands of people beneath them. It was less people earning money and more a transfer of wealth from the bottom 96% to those at the top. Then, in the late 50s, two seasoned Neutralite salesmen left and formed a new MLM, Amway which sold basic household items like detergent and body wash. These dudes, one of whom birthed Betsy DeVos' husband, didn't merely carbon copy the model, they brought in God. As Fitzpatrick puts it, Amway turned earning money into a moral crusade by promising wealth as a salvation and proclaiming failure as a sin. That is to say, good Christians sell soap, and lots of it. It's no wonder that one sociologist called Amway a quasi-religious corporation for its success at grafting commercialism onto existing models of evangelical Christianity. As Fitzpatrick elaborates, Amway's moral tone and Christian rhetoric blended inexplicably with patriotism and capitalism were adopted by many MLMs that followed. Christian churches became hotbeds of MLM recruiting with clergy in the uplines. That's right, your pastor might be trying to sell you on a lucrative opportunity involving laundry detergent. And importantly, many of history's most successful MLMs today sell products like face creams, vitamins, and diet pills. And these just so happen to be products known for their reliance on questionable marketing claims, which encourage the same magical thinking that gets people to join MLMs in the first place. So now that we know where MLMs came from, it's worth asking, how do they get millions of people to join? And more bafflingly, how do they get people to stay in an economic opportunity that's mathematically destined to fail? Let's investigate via Amway, the big daddy of MLMs. Amway exploded during the economic downturn of the mid-1970s. It was a time of stagflation, the destruction of unions, the privatization of social safety nets, and so on. This environment created the perfect conditions for MLMs to seem like an enticing opportunity. Amway's success would only intensify in the buzzy, consumer-happy decades to come. So it doesn't sound that hard to make people join. After all, as human beings, we're wired for low effort, high reward prospects. Just ask your great uncle who buys five lottery tickets every week. But let's say you're intrigued by an MLM. How do they get you to stay once you've learned that it's hell on earth? It's simple, they take over your life. That's according to Stephen Butterfield, a former Amway salesperson who wrote a tell-all book about their practices. According to him, Amway slowly but surely takes over every aspect of your existence. Your upline recruiter convinces you to give up outside friends and hobbies. There's also low-key brainwashing. For instance, Amway convinces you to buy expensive motivational tapes recorded by the company's founders and tells you to listen to them every day. This practice is what Fitzpatrick describes as pseudo-psychological self-improvement programs. This makes sense because MLMs don't actually offer tangible economic rewards to their participants. So they have to, like cemetery salesmen, sell people on an idea. As Fitzpatrick puts it, MLMs seek to capture the mind of the recruit. 
money will follow. The more they believe and the longer they believe, the more money the company gets from them. And once they get you to buy in, they keep you by exerting increasing control over your choices. As Butterfield explains, you follow your recruiter's advice on everything from how to cut your hair to what kind of motorhome you should buy. He details the various bonkers advice that MLM leaders offer on things like marriage, sexual practices, and how to raise your children. We see a similar ethos reflected in current MLMs, most notably LuLaRoe. We were supposed to be empowered at first, and then the husband was supposed to take over. And like other MLMs, Amway also demands all of your time. As Butterfield notes, Amway insists distributors work five to six nights a week on recruitment and sustaining their business. They pump you up at creepy social events, where upwards of 10,000 people stand for hours in the dark, holding candles, shouting Amway-themed chants. Butterfield says that the events often go past midnight and crowds pour out into the streets at 3 a.m., still chanting their mantras. Let's take a trip, let's get away. It's no wonder, then, that author Amanda Montell argues that MLMs are, if not straight-up cults, at the very least, cultish. For more on that, check out our recent video on the topic. Like a cult, an effective MLM subsumes the lives of their members, it reshapes their worldviews and priorities, and it threatens serious social and economic repercussions to anyone who even considers leaving. But maybe you're thinking, it's all worth it for the money you're gonna make, right? Um, did you just black out? You absolutely will not profit. Unless you invented the MLM or joined right away, you will lose money. So there you have it. MLMs are an almost guaranteed economic loss and a very not fun culty vibe. So how have they survived? Well, importantly, they've bought a shit ton of political clout via their gigantic direct marketing lobby. Check out Fitzpatrick's book, Ponzinomics, for an in-depth breakdown of that insane story. But for now, we're gonna focus on the culture and the psychology that has sustained MLMs, because that seems just as important as the government corruption that's helped them along. And for that, we'll need to jump back in time again to the moment MLMs appeared on the scene, the post-World War II economic boom. This was approximately the same time as the birth of the consumer-based economy, where increased production capacity meant there was a lot more shit being made, and thus, a lot more shit to buy. Suddenly, consumer behavior needed to stop being entirely needs-based and started becoming a whole lot more wants-based. So how do you get people to want shit they don't absolutely need? You sell them. Hard. Unsurprisingly, the late 40s, early 50s was also the birth of the salesification of American society. Per historian Richard Huber, while sales was once considered a separate occupation, it was rapidly becoming a way of life. America was becoming a nation of salesmen. At the same time, sociologist C. Wright Mills concurred that the growing influence of sales in this time meant that in public and in private, there is the tang and feel of salesmanship. Salespeople, especially of the door-to-door -door variety, had once constituted a specific small role in the economy and were often derided as kind of predatory. But as companies had more and more shit to sell, sales got a major rebrand, and the explosion of advertising, PR, marketing, and so on meant that more and more people's jobs were based around getting people to buy more shit they didn't need. Check out our How Advertising Changed video for more on that. Anyway, that's why the emergence of MLMs at this moment in time makes perfect sense. Multi-level marketing is the logical conclusion of a sales-based economy, where everything revolves around selling products, then selling people on the opportunity to themselves sell more of these products. But this, as many a tortured economist has howled into the wind, doesn't make sense. See, the reason 80% of MLM recruits quit in the first year is because MLMs don't function under rules of supply and demand. They grow not because of consumer demand, but by selling the members on the lie of economic success. Then, those people buy a ton of the product to sell themselves, thus generating revenue for the company. After a while, you've completely oversaturated any given area with salespeople. It's the equivalent of every person who likes going to their local Wendy's subsequently opening a Wendy's on the same block because the cashier was really fucking charismatic. But let's set aside the irrationality. The real point is that the salesification of society has normalized the interactions you have over Facebook with Ash Linden as she tries one last time to get you to come to her meal replacement soy shake party. In an MLM-led world, the mix of money and friendship no longer seems strange. According to Fitzpatrick, prior to 1930, bringing up finances or money making with buddies wasn't super kosher. But, he elaborates, overall reactions to these devious financial intrusions into personal spheres of life, worship, friendship, family, have declined from moral outrage to mere annoyance or grudging tolerance. For many others, there is no longer any boundary at all. 
And to us, that's what's most nefarious about MLMs. Besides, you know, the bankruptcy, clinical depression, divorce, and overall despair that the industry's been known to cause. Because on a socio-cultural level, MLMs obliterate the line between markets and private life, family members and customers, friends and employees. In doing so, they essentially reduce all human relationships to transactions. Butterfield wrote as much, saying, Amway begins to change your life the first time you approach your friends and family members to sell them the products or recruit them into the business. Hitherto, you related with them as friend, brother, sister, son, daughter. Now you're relating as a salesperson to a customer. Friendship is no longer primary. It is a means to the end. According to him, once you recruit a friend to an MLM, your relationship becomes a completely prefabricated business association in which honest friendship gradually becomes impossible. This is almost too fitting for our weird era of late capitalism, where everything is a commodity and every person a brand with potential to peddle that commodity. And above all, MLMs work at an almost lizard brain level, exploiting the most American belief that all you need to succeed is an opportunity, hard work, and dedication. And on the flip side, if you fail to succeed, it's on you. Now, obviously, this is a myth that has become increasingly untrue over recent decades. Work hours and productivity are way up, while wealth is down for most folks by every metric. If MLMs were somewhat delusional for our grandparents in the 50s, for us they're a downright fairy tale where nobody becomes a princess in the end. And not in a subversive Shrek way either. I'm supposed to be beautiful. But you are beautiful. And in this way, MLMs aren't that different from the American economy at large, which assures us that hard work will be rewarded with high pay, or that an expensive college degree will yield a steady lifestyle, or that home ownership will equate to lifelong security. MLMs are just an exaggerated, almost cartoonish form of this toothless myth. They offer riskier opportunities, make bolder promises, and screw you over even more. And I'm also having to claim bankruptcy. In this way, they're an almost too perfect distillation of a society that overpromises, underdelivers, and then blames you for your problems. But what do you guys think? After everything you've heard, are you still interested in starting your own small business where you pick up your own hours and are your own boss? If so, please let me know in my Twitter DMs because boy, do I have an opportunity for you. Big thanks to our patrons for all your support and don't forget to check out our podcast. Hit that subscribe button like you're emptying your bank account to buy a lifetime supply of plant fertilizer and don't forget to ring that bell. And as always, thanks for watching. Peace.